everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, episode 182, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I'm Dan. I'm Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things Gen Conical and Sylvological Part 2, because we're going to talk about forests today and how to survive going through living in and being around uh, the forest. So if you have any questions for us, drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. We've only ever had a couple of those, so by all means, get your voice on this podcast. People can hear you too. So, Josh, any announcements about Gen Con, booth times, play times? Yes. So when this episode drops will be the day before Gen Con opens. So I will be in Indianapolis if you are listening to this on launch day. Insert fanfare music here. Yeah, Gen Con starts August 3rd. Because we only have so much booth space, we've had our times apportioned for when we are going to be there. If you are at Gen Con and want to say hi, my booth time is actually pretty limited. I will be there Saturday morning from when the hall opens uh, until about 1130, so 10 a.m. to 1130 because I have a game going on at noon. This is on Saturday. And so we'll need time to grab a bite to eat between my booth time and running, running the game. game. So that's the only time where, where I will be actually be at the booth. Morgan will be at the booth a little bit more because Morgan is not running games. Uh, Morgan will be there Thursday afternoon for a couple of hours and then Friday morning and Sunday morning uh, for a couple of hours each. We will be available and may be found other places at other times. Feel free, if whatever doesn't work out, to reach out to me, at least, uh, if you want to say hi. And that's cool because I'd, I'd like to do that. I can certainly like meet somebody at the booth. There's just no space for me, so we'd have to like find another place uh, to kind of move slightly out of the way to converse or whatever. Yeah. Also, a reminder, we haven't gotten any of them yet. If you have questions for Lou, our as of yet not completely scheduled or not scheduled at all conversation <laughs> with Lou, which will be taking place in a few weeks, then get them to us at that same email address, edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Mark that they are for Lou, either in the subject line or at the beginning of the email, uh, so that we can set those aside and hang on to those for when we talk to him. Exactly. And since we don't know when it's going to take place, please get them to us sooner than, rather than later. Yeah. We want yours to be missed. I suspect it probably won't be until sometime in September. Because of the time that I'll be away and then coming back and getting into the swing of things just in time for kids to go back to school at the end of August, beginning of September, probably yeah. won't be settled back into a normal routine until sometime in September for us to schedule that. Yeah. We will probably hammer out a time and probably have a more specific announcement saying, this is the date that it's happening. This is your last chance to get questions in if you yeah. have them. Because we don't, we don't have any regard for Lou's schedule. We have to worry about Josh's schedule and my schedule. Lou just feels, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> we'll make it work. We'll figure it out. But it is definitely a post-Gen Con yeah. thing. I think that covers it for now. Fair. There's other stuff brewing, but I'm not allowed to talk about it as of the time of this recording. If it has happened... Keep your eyes out for Alamaze. That's all I'm going to say. Alamaze has been showing up online exactly. with some other stuff that has made Andy a little bit upset <laughs> in terms of that that Weasley yes. dragon uh, spilling yeah. secrets. So keep your eyes out for Alamaze. Alamaze will spill what's uh, maybe, maybe going on here and there. Anyway, that takes care of the Gen Conical portion of our show. On to the Sylvological. Sylvological? Sylvological. Silvological. Because I'm going to butcher the name in the first place. The Silvological portion of our show, How to Survive in the Forests. And now there's two big forests to worry about. We'll get to those later. This is going to start off with some generalities because Bar Save has hundreds of unnamed forests. There are two that are named, the Bloodwood and the Poison Forest. We'll get to both of those a little bit later. So, Yeah, and in this context, we're talking about unnamed in the sense that they are not necessarily 
magically named with a true pattern sort of thing. The locals probably have a name for them. For example, the broadly speaking, various forests and groves of trees that are not really sort of known by any specific name broadly. Some of these forests may actually be named in the magical sense, but essentially we're talking about all of the forests that are not the Bloodwood or the Poison Forest, which are the ones that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Absolutely. Uh, this actually has, is something near and dear to my heart because my last name translated, or at least defined, means of the deep, dark woods. So I like this episode already. We're only five minutes in. Anyway, uh, so most of the forests we're going to come across... Um, because around a river, it's a jungle usually because it's very wet. Uh, forests are usually typically drier. Most of these have oak trees, ash trees, some pine trees. So they're more tree prevalent than a jungle normally normally would be. However, also in forests, you're going to find flowers, creeping vines, grasses, moss, of course, mushrooms because they grow everywhere. But they, the forests also, by the way, have more underbrush. We said last time that the jungles usually don't because all the resources are up high. Tend forests to. tend to be, yes. Forests actually do have some low-growing plants. And in Bar Save, most of those low-growing plants are poisonous to the touch. Just, again, how to survive <laughs> in the forests of Bar Save. Yeah, and part of the reason for that, to get into a little bit of ecology here, is that forests, as opposed to jungles, are typically found in more temperate regions, where the trees are deciduous, which means that they lose their leaves every season. Yeah. In the fall, the, the leaves drop, and then new leaves are grown in the spring for oak and ash and maple and trees Whatever. like that. And then that leaf litter decomposes and forms a very rich soil and mulch that is very useful for other living things to feed on and grow out of from funguses and mushrooms and lichens and things like that to smaller plants and vines and all that sort of thing. One thing that's actually a little bit different that I want to mention, and this is something that's going to be a bit more likely when you're talking about the higher altitude woodlands Mm -hmm. where you get into more evergreen trees like pines In a pine forest, you actually tend to get back to the level of not as much underbrush as you do like compared to a jungle. And part of the reason for this is that because they're evergreens, that is, they don't lose their their leaves seasonally, the needles, which are the leaves of an evergreen tree or a fir Mm -hmm. tree, which is a type of evergreen, they block out the sunlight for a longer period of time. What happens in the spring with a deciduous forest is that because none of the trees have leaves, there's plenty of sunlight that can get down to the lower levels to help the smaller trees grow. But the other thing is that pine needles are kind of acidic and mess with the soil. Yes. It's kind of a a survival strategy. Mm -hmm. Their needles poison the soil for other plants around them and makes yeah. it very difficult for them to grow. I have two pine trees in my yard. I was going to bring this up, but yeah. Keep talking. <laughs> my family has a um has a summer place up here in Maine in the woods. The woods around it is a mix of oaks and pines because we're sort of at that latitude where things are kind of starting to transition from one to the other and the roof shingles on the place One, get a lot of lichen and moss growing on them. Yeah. But two, you need to go up there and periodically like sweep off the pine needles. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they eat into the into the shingles and cause problems potentially with like leaks and whatnot. They're not going to cause any problems for like the actual like structural wood underneath it. But the uh, the asphalt shingles could run into some problems with that, especially where they're also getting chewed into by lichens and moss. Yes. But anyway, that's something to sort of keep in mind if you're not familiar. You know, I know that probably a lot of our European listeners, particularly those in the more northerly parts of Europe, you know, are probably familiar with the sort of thing that we're talking about. Totally. Yeah, those of you in the Sahara Desert have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, (laughs) But no, underneath my pine trees, grass does not grow because there's a nice bed of pine needles that needs to be swept up every once in a while. But man, nothing grows under there. It just, no. And actually, 
related to that, I don't know if this is something that was sort of on your list to cover later, but it's a good segue. Hit me. A good shelter can actually be found underneath pine mm-hmm. trees because you have an area that is sort of cleared out and doesn't have other grass and undergrowth and things like that. Mm-hmm. The canopy of the pine above it can actually have a little bit of a sheltered space, particularly yeah. if you're in a, a colder weather or dealing with snow and such, like we kind of talked about with the mountains. Exactly. So I'm tying that, back but- together. Totally. No, I have uh, my, my tallest pine tree in the backyard actually has a couple of branches cut out and uh, my kids use that as a, as a kind of hidey hole when they're playing uh, tag uh, or nerf tag um, with nerf guns. So yeah, clear out a couple of branches there. The overhead, the, the long extended low hanging branches will just drape down like an umbrella. So yeah, yeah. use that as shelter. It's and typically thing. it's not uncommon for those lower internal branches to actually be effectively dead yep. and easy to break off for yep. folks to use for kindling to actually build a fire and things like that. Oh yeah. And all these dead pine needles are fantastic, uh, kindling. <laughs> we'll yeah. just light up like a, like a match. So, and in my backyard underneath that tree, a rabbit family has made their warren. So <laughs> not sure where it lives, but there's a groundhog in our neighborhood that I've seen around. Yeah. Fair. So we talked about in the jungle that water eventually wins every battle in the jungle. The question in forests is, of course, where to get potable water, you know, that you can actually ingest and keep yourself alive with. There are, of course, streams in forests. There are some lakes and there are some ponds. When you get water, the, the essay was wonderfully descriptive in Earth on Survival Guide book, that if you're going to be doing this, if you happen to be upstream, it's a lot safer because occasionally... In bar safe, especially, uh, if you come across a pond or a lake that has a carcass on the, on the, sorry, on the shore, not a great place to get water from because the dead thing is either poisoned the water or the water is already poisoned and made the thing dead. Mm -hmm. Or there's a horror there, something along those lines. So if you see any floating fish, very dense algae or algae. Yeah, algae blooms. Yeah. Our algae for our our British listeners, because I'm pronouncing it their way and both ways. Be careful of those things there. So any thoughts or comments on water foraging? Elementalists with a purify water spell. Yeah. Super handy for that. Even if you don't have an elementalist with that magic, uh, if you boil the water beforehand, that can make it safer when it comes to at least traditional toxins and microbes and things like that, that that could make you sick. That's certainly a case. I could certainly conceive of a magic item similar to the pot of Groomba, for example, that is a yeah. sort of magical pot that you could put water in and it would effectively cast purify Perfect. water on the water that you put into it. I imagine that would actually be something that would be a useful magical item. I imagine that people actually probably would have come up with that. I don't know that they're actually game stats or anything like that. But uh, hey, look at the enchanting chapter of (laughs) the companion. You know, you maybe get a sense of where that might be in terms of a difficulty to create. Obviously, for there to be significant plant growth, there needs to be at least some amount of water uh, for the plants to draw on. Although in many cases, it is sort of within the soil itself. So you will, you know, have ponds and lakes and streams and whatnot yeah. growing in and around and what and that sort of thing. But yeah, algae blooms are nasty because it typically means that the carbon dioxide levels in the water are out of mm-hmm. whack because yeah. typically the algae are, as plants usually are, feeding off the carbon dioxide. And if the water is that poorly oxygenated, then fish and other creatures that normally live in the pond or whatever are probably not doing so well. Exactly. So anyway, uh, that covers water resources. Um, And since you were speaking about some of the uh, plant life and vegetation there, um, I'll skip over that, in fact, and go to the fauna, really, because we were talking about rabbits earlier. So some of the creatures you can find in a forest. A little bit different than a jungle, not a lot, a little bit. Obviously, all kinds of birds, rabbits, deer, elk, squirrels, badgers, weasels, mice, wolves, 
muskrats, frogs, owls, you know, your basic Disney film, you know, yeah. Bambi, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, you know, whatever, whatever they've drawn on, on, on the screen there. Uh, and that doesn't even cover the magical beasts that Josh can probably l- figure out a litany of. Right. Again, we talked about Morgan's <laughs> blog, Panda Gaming Grove. There is, I'm certain, a uh, a list. A list. Ever resourceful, Josh is going to check that out for us now. Creature habitats. Let's see. <laughs> Forest. Guinness is mentioned. Oh, the Guinness, yeah. Q. Monkeys. Oh, yeah, I forgot monkeys. You mentioned birds, but the blood raven in particular. Mm. Leechrat, apes, boars, brithen, shadow mant. Uh, the, those are typically nocturnal. Zokes, spiders, yeah. you know, wolves, bear, uh, ogres are sometimes Spot. found in that area. But yeah, on uh, Panda's uh, website, Panda Gaming oh. Grove. Yeah. There's a creature habitats link right on the sort of right hand sidebar there. And that takes it to to a list and you can select what type of habitat you want. And it's basically a list of the creatures that can be found within that environment. Fair. So any popular, uh, any movies or TV shows you can think of that involve forest survival of any kind? Involve forest survival? Nothing immediately comes to mind. Or things you can find in a forest. Well, yeah, actually, you know, actually, you just mentioned it. The original Predator. Yeah. Actually, although that's more jungle than forest. Yeah, fair. The recent Hulu release sequel to it, Prey. Oh, yeah. Which is Predator, but set in colonial era North America, Mm -hmm. dealing with, you know, a a native woman- Fighting the predator in the forest <laughs> and yeah. the plains somewhat, I think. So that's something that works there. You don't get much of the survival aspect of it, but uh, frequently like Robin Hood hmm. movies yeah. yes. because of Sherwood Forest mm-hmm. will have like a woodland environment that the uh, Merry Men and, and Robin operate out of. Yeah. I was thinking uh, First Blood. First Blood. Mm-hmm. The original... Rambo movie, uh, Mm -hmm. which is kind of different than the others. Anything based off of Jack London stories. Good point. White Fang like has had like a dozen different movie versions of it. Those (laughs) tend to be a little bit more subarctic forests. Yeah, a little more northerly. But they're a lot. They tend to be a lot more like survival oriented, Mm -hmm. and so those work not only for forests but also for the cold and mountainous regions, like we mentioned before. Yeah. Because forests are, in one sense, the default setting, like one of the well, not just not setting, but like one of the default environments in North yeah. America, <laughs> forest does not seem to be something that is unfamiliar. And so okay. there are a lot of things that are sort of set in forests or near forested areas mm-hmm. that don't really focus on the forest necessarily so much. Oh, uh, the original Hunger Games. Yeah, Hunger Games. Place in a forest there. That could work. Again, it doesn't really deal with the forest so much as a survival aspect, but early John Cusack movie, The Journey of Natty Gan. Oh, yeah. Which is a story about a, a young woman who is traveling across country, kind of hobo lifestyle, trying to find her father who is working a logging camp in the Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of travel along rail lines and through woods and things like that. Yeah. Early John Cusack role. Meredith Salinger. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. How's that for a deep pull? That is a deep cut. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize that. That is her. Now that you mentioned, I'm like, oh, yeah, that is a young Meredith and Salinger. I did not have to look that one up. I knew that one. <laughs> <laughs> but there are lots of places i don't know god there have been like a million oh. seasons of survivor oh. i don't know that they've actually had any that were set in a forest they're almost always set in like jungles or like tropical and, yeah. areas and beaches um, and stuff there's a movie called into the wild based upon a book because it's a true story i don't remember who wrote the book his name is jack something 
this guy just wanted to live in the wild. And so he left behind all of his earthly possessions, left behind his car and hitchhiked on, on trains into Alaska. And so oh, is this the guy that ended up dying? Yes. Okay. Yes. That doesn't deal with the forest a whole lot not because lot. he's up in like the tundra. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a story of what not to do. Correct. The movie takes a, little, a few liberties, but the book is yeah. better, obviously. But, you know, if you wanted some inspiration. Well, shoot, there was one that I was just came to mind and then I forgot it. Because we talked about Meredith Salinger. So, <laughs> yeah, they don't have Meredith Salinger. <laughs> it now completely slipped out of my mind. I don't yeah, know dang. what I was thinking of. Um, Fair. So I just needed to. Oh, get- yes. Now, no, sorry. Now I do. Now I remember. Yeah, I knew that. It's like required reading for most school kids up here in Maine. I don't know if they do it as often as they used to, but it used to be like every school would read this, at, have this be something that the high school kids read at some hmm. point, usually in like between like eighth and 10th grade. Yeah. It's a memoir. It is a true story called Lost on a Mountain in Maine. Hmm. It is uh, by a guy by the name of Don Fendler, who I think now has finally, he may have passed away. But he used to like regularly go to schools to talk about this book. It's basically a story of how when he was a boy. Yeah. It was on a hiking trip with his scout troop, I think, Hmm. in Baxter State Park, which is the north end of the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. He gets separated from his troop and spends several days alone in the main wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of it's it's a memoir. It's a story of of that experience. There's also um, a Stephen King no- novella short novel called The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Oh, gotcha. Which is a little bit more like has a little bit more of a semi supernatural aspect of it. It's a young girl in this case who gets separated from her family while hiking in the main woods. And the like next few days of her experiences in that. Hmm. Tom Gordon being a uh, former pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, who appears in the story as a kind of spirit guide to this girl, because, of course, Tom Gordon, at the time that King wrote it, was a like a really strong relief pitcher for the Red Sox. You know, the girl was like the relationship with her dad was like really closely tied to baseball. And there was that. And then there was like this thing potentially in the woods that's never made clear whether it's something that's just in her imagination or if it's this actual ancient spirit kind of thing that's stalking her. But that's also got a lot of woodland survival stuff to it. Spirits, how earth dawnish, Stephen. Yeah. Well done, you. (laughs) Tying this all back into earth dawn. (laughs) There are plenty of things that you could draw on or look to for inspiration a lot of cases where the forest the woods are almost a character uh, Mm -hmm. in a sense in terms of the environment that they provide yeah i mentioned last time about the brothers Grimm and the deep forest and fairy tales and folklore like Little Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel and things like that, where the forest is <laughs> really kind of dark, where if you couldn't feed your kids, you would kind of like take them and leave them in the woods to starve. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of that with the presence of the forest as a potentially dark, wild Non-player character, essentially. is semi-malevolent, perhaps, depending on the style of story. A lot of stories, again, kind of talking and connecting into European folklore, whether Western Europe or Central Europe, or even into places like Ukraine and yeah, Russia and whatnot, where you've got this sort of Slavic relationship with the woods and there's a lot of cool stuff that can go on there i wish i had better suggestions for (laughs) non-european connections of that but other places you're typically again looking at like jungles and whatnot as opposed to forest which are from something of a cultural approach tend to end up being a, a little bit more western in their sense. Um, although I imagine given the terrain of say South America, the more mountainous parts, 
you can probably find similar kind of uh, folklore and stories and legends uh, among some of the the natives from Chile and the highlands of Argentina and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I don't have the familiarity with them that I wish I did. Yeah, I got nothing. We mentioned the fact that this could be possibly a a dark and brooding and imposing kind of terrain or almost a character to bring to life if in, in your games if you want to be the game master for this. But on the flip side, then there's also the idea of them being bastions of life and survival. It is very yes. common for communities to live on the edge of a woodland and to be able to make their living from it in a sense yeah. of the resources that are available there, the wood and things like that. If you want to get even more classic fantasy, you've got Rivendell and Lothlorien from Tolkien, uh, the sort of epitome of elven woodland. Yes. Protected and shaped by the magic of the powerful individuals that live there and how those are in a sense sort of bastions of old magic, but in a positive way, um, as opposed to Mirkwood. I can't believe that it took us this long to get to Tolkien. There's like three <laughs> big examples talking about forests. You know, then you've got Mirkwood with the spiders and all of that. I mean, Tolkien doesn't get super deep into that, but there is yeah. a lot of cultural osmosis that infests the fantasy genre drawn from those places. <laughs> Fair. So to that end, the essay goes on to say that the horrors, and we didn't talk about the horrors much in the jungle episode either, because the horrors don't really prefer to dwell in the jungles or the forests because their very existence there begins to spread their corruption and kill off the vegetation, drive away the animals, drive the animals into non-friendly versions of themselves. And so their presence there makes the surroundings a dead giveaway that a horror is nearby. Yeah, that is definitely something that would clue in and could be used as a plot hook or setting thing. Even if there isn't necessarily a horror around the presence of a dead zone Mm -hmm. or patch of forest that is twisted or broken or marked in some capacity because of something that might have happened there before. Yeah. You, know, you talk about stories again to get back to the to the darker end of things, the haunted forest, places like that that are taboo in a sense of that you don't go there uh, if you value your survival. Totally. So we've mentioned the flora and some fauna. We haven't actually mentioned any other name givers. A lot of elves, to Josh's point, uh, like making uh, villages in and around, especially in the forest. You will find windling villages there as well, but higher up in the trees because, you know, wings. And yep. that'll take care of that. Also, not name giver specific, but uh, wood spirits and earth spirits abound in the forests. And They so certainly can. You've got your conversation pieces and your 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 non-player characters to interact with, windlings especially, elves especially, and, you know, other races may be in some forests as well. Humans are pretty adaptable to everywhere, everywhere they want to go. And then you've got your spirits there as well. So that covers forests in general. Let's talk about the Bloodwood. And then we start getting into the specific ones. We've talked about the Bloodwood a lot on this show. Yes. Not a lot, a lot, but we have brought it up many times. We've dabbled. Without getting too <laughs> much into the weeds on the Bloodwood, because... Anybody who has listened to this show for a while knows that I can go on about the Bloodwood for quite a long time. Yes. The Bloodwood is an area that I think emotionally and temperamentally, from a story standpoint, should feel like that stereotypical, iconic, haunted forest. Yes. That the trees are alive in a sense, like that the forest itself is alive and watching you and does not want you there. That is something that is actually kind of an effect of the Ritual of Thorns Mm -hmm. that has made the Bloodwood what it is, but then there's also the growing corruption from its heart. So depending on where in the wood you are, that feeling could be greater or lesser. And of course, to a sense, the wood actually is watching you. There are plenty of plant spirits 
commonly in the form of thorn men yep. that have been tasked by the blood warders and other magicians of the wood to guard its borders and either capture or turn away anyone who tries to break its exile. Yes. And the bloodwood actually is different than all the other forests. I can't say combined uh, because the bloodwood, because of its magical nature and the fact that it was a care, an above ground care during the scourge, the magic used, pardon? Parts of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The entire wood was not a care. The care Sorry. was sort of in the heart of the wood. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> there were also some portions of that that were underground as well. It wasn't all solely above ground, but all of the protections were wooden and declined the Theron rights of protection yeah. and passage. So wanted to, thank you for clarifying. I was going to mis misspeak entirely, so you made a better point. Uh, but the bloodwood is different because all of the trees in the bloodwood are technically bigger than most of the other forests, and especially around the center of the Bloodwood where the care was. Uh, those are basically like California redwoods. Those are ginormous trees. So if you need an, if you need an example, yeah. Return of the Jedi was filmed in California redwoods area. So you want an example how big those trees are? Go look them up. That's how big those trees are. But the Bloodwood also has all kinds of cover on the forest floor because it's been around forever and all the magic used <clears throat> in all the, the elemental spirits and uh, blood elves and thornmen and so forth. There are vines and creepers and mosses and grasses and flowers and brambles. And, you know, um, some of these things are remnants of cares. So if you're looking for a different take on a care, go to the edges of the Bloodwood or involve your game around there. Yeah, the Bloodwood just has so much potential for unsettling experience for player characters. Ooh, I Yeah, like super creepy but also super alive. Mm -hmm. It's not creepy in the way that say a horror corrupted woodland yeah. would be. It's creepy because in a sense of the the riot of life that is there and how because of the magics that were used there and everything the plant life is i don't want to say carnivorous but the plant life feeds on the blood yes. that is present there and it's not just the elves that drip blood but a lot of the other vegetate yeah animal life and whatnot there as well feeds that and i just like the image of crossing over into the wood proper and feeling the ground squish and picking your foot up and seeing blood pooled and then kind of yeah. sinking back into the dirt in like the sort of quote unquote marshier areas. Yeah. Any muddy stains on your shoes are going to end up red. Yeah. It's just, again, epitome haunted forest, creepy kind of mm -hmm. wrongness. There, there should be a sense of wrongness coupled with the beauty that the epitome of elven culture is sort of known mm -hmm. for. To take it back to Tolkien, blood wood is what would have happened to Lothlorien <laughs> if <laughs> she had taken the ring. Okay, there you go. It's still beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's also wrong in a way that... I want to say is difficult to put your finger on, but no, it's pretty easy to put your <laughs> finger on it. <laughs> they made this one easy. I Again, I don't want to go too much more no, into won't. this. Go back to one of the other episodes that we have talked about with Any the Bloodwood. No, we did, we, did a, we did a geographical episode of the Bloodwood once upon a time. We did. And again, I think just the descriptions, the smell of yeah. the place... And the sense that you are being watched even when there is nothing but plants yeah. around. Uh, I, I, Again, that's that sort of like fundamental. This place is alive in a way that other forests and woodlands typically are not. I think the not. word I was looking for before was eerie, not creepy. Yeah. So the bloodwood is Yeah, that's eerie, a good word. Whereas a, a horror-infested place would be creepy. So – Distinction there. I think the essay has the best uh, uh, survival tip of all time on the Bloodwood. Enter while, enter while the there. daylight shines, do business quickly, harm nothing, and leave before nightfall. <laughs> if you must go there. That's how to do it. 
tip number one, if you if if you want to go there, exactly. Don't. Tip number two, if you have to you go there, <laughs> you're better off making contacts at Eidolon yes. and making those deals there. And if you don't have to go into the wood at all, that's so exactly. much the better. But yeah, the wood is just mm -hmm. wrong. Really cool. Yes. Awesome. It that's just a really great setting. Is. So uh, that's the northern part of the map. The western part of the map, and I do mean the f on the, the flip far side western part of the map. I was going to say the far western part of the map, whereas the Bloodwood is more alive, other than most other yes. woodlands. The antithesis the of that forest, which is the poison <laughs> forest, located between Jerus and the yeah. Wastes, it is a place that is infected with the ash that blows in from the yeah. wastes and it has trapped the poison forest the woodland in a perpetual state of dying mm -hmm. it's not dead but it's not really alive anymore yeah. either everything is undead decaying but still alive and just really it's at really the edge of death really yeah, really, really unpleasant. The Bloodwood, there are rivers there. You can get water. potable yeah. water there. You can get fresh water there. You might need, you know, you, the same kind of rules perhaps applies as water and so forth in any other woodland environment. You want to pack in everything into the poison forest. You want to pack in water. You want to pack in food. I don't know whether the rules actually say it. I would be inclined to maybe impose higher difficulty numbers or extra success requirements for attempting to use purify water on water that you would find there just because of the depth mm -hmm. of the corruption that exists there. I'm inclined to agree. As the essay says, the poison forest is not dead, but caught in the process, the eternally caught in the pro terrible process of yes. dying. It's on the edge of death every day. Yeah. And so the plants there are the punky dry rot kind of wet. If you go to break off a branch, it doesn't like give a clean snap. It kind of wet peels off. Peel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Animals that you encounter there have like open sores and their skin and fur kind of sloughing off of them and exposed muscle yeah. filmy One eyes step where they taxidermy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just really, really nasty and horrors and horror tainted oh, yeah. creatures abound within that area as well. The bloodwood is dangerous in its own way, but I but the poison forest is, I would think, actually even more dangerous in a sense. The bloodwood doesn't want you there, like you will get that feeling yeah. from the bloodwood. But if you don't trouble anything, it's content to let you yeah. go. The poison forest mess you up. will mess you up, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't perhaps have the same presence in the sense that like, you don't feel that the poison forest itself is sort of watching you, but the very presence of the eternal decay and death that pervades the place – attempts to get into everything. Yeah. It's like walking through the the bloodwood you could feel you could feel the life around you. There's this energy to it. Whereas if you walk through the poison forest you can feel how hollow and empty that is. Yeah, they really are flip sides of the same yeah. coin. Yeah. What the magic broadly speaking has sort of done to these places or the effect of the magic where one is anti-horror in its own way, but still corruptive and dangerous, whereas the other is just dark and evil. It's like a haunted house, but in the woods. It's like a haunted, yeah. it's a haunted house. <laughs> so, yeah, the Poison Forest is, by the way, north northernmost foothills of the Dolores Mountains. So, like I said, western part of the map. Uh, there could be a few lost cares found within. Explore those at your own peril. If you are very, very curious, uh, let's engage some other senses though. The poison forest has this smell, this aroma to it where it reeks of decay and rot and putrefaction. Yes. Uh, the essay says it smells worse than a battlefield of dead bodies. Yeah. 
in a healthy woodland, there is a sort of smell to that because you've got that cycle of life that's going on with mushrooms and the natural decay of leaves falling and being broken down into mulch and the worms and the Mm -hmm. soil and all of that. It's a healthy decay kind of smell. People who do gardening uh, know what I'm the, talking about. The loamy earth, as it's called. It's a sort of rich, lifey yeah, smell. Earthy. Yeah, or, I mean, the definition yes, of it smells earthy. Like, smells, like, <laughs> smells like not just dry dirt, but wet dirt. So you know, something could grow there. Yeah, whereas the poison forest is... Desolate. <laughs> desolate. Well, the smell of bloated plague corpses, yeah. of a battlefield, of a charnel yeah. house... The decay that is taking place there is not the healthy decay of the natural cycle of life breaking down the food chain. The recycling of nutrients there. Yeah. This is pestilent meat. (laughs) Yeah, this is the complete opposite of that. Yeah, this is, you can't even hold your nose to get rid of the smell. It's going to, it's going to permeate your pores when you walk through there. The wood that you find there isn't really going to burn very well, and anything that you might get to burn is going to, like, smoke badly and not give off a whole lot of light or heat. Again, like, wet. (laughs) Blah. Just blah. Yeah. Uh, So. Describing it to your players should make them want to take a shower. Exactly. Uh, so to get some other visuals for you, the very, uh, the trees that are there are all twisted blackened they have very few brownish leaves that are all brittle um to josh what he said earlier there's this fine black ash soot that falls from the dark clouds that come over from the wastes uh, leaving a literal film of black dust over everything there are no bird calls there is no breeze there is no noise this is the absence of noise this is the so- most quiet and silent place you will walk through you will hear every single footfall you will hear every single inhale and exhale of breath you will begin to f- eventually feel your own heartbeat in your ears as your players walk through the 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 poison forest people who have experience with forests whether because they live in the woods or or have hiked in the woods or that kind of thing. There is always this background noise of life, bird yeah. calls, the sound of animals going the through the underbrush. Yeah, the hum of insects. There is sort of hard coded in our evolutionary background that if the woods fall silent, something bad is present because all of the other animals are trying to yeah. avoid Being detected notice of whatever is there. The poison forest is that all the time. Agreed. So we mentioned spirits in the bloodwood. So if you come across spirits in the poison forest, they are (sighs) twisted and hideous, as are any beasts or birds or anything else you come across in the poison forest, uh, because everything's in a constant state of decay, uh, which makes them, by the way, the spirits, the beasts, the birds, any active thing any movable thing that comes any any independent creature there hates all living things so even the most timid rabbits monkeys little tiny finches they will all attack any living thing in the poison forest so if you're going to send your party there yes it's barren but be ready for a bunch of encounters because your game master should say Well, they're going to sense the life, and like a zombie horde, they will come after you. Yeah, you will definitely want to avail yourself of the masks in the companion that deal with corrupted or cadaverous sorts of creatures to spice up the uh, encounters that you might have in that area. There are quite a few. The the cadaverous batch of masks would be really good. Corrupted ones, obviously, again, ways to not even necessarily make creatures tougher or more difficult, but to reflect how they might be affected by the nature of where they are. Definitely uh, things to to keep in mind on that. So the survival strategy 
since you can go to the Bloodwood and find fresh water, forage for fruit, vegetables, whatever not, and edible plants, and occasionally hunt, maybe to your liking, who knows? Yeah, the Poison Forest doesn't offer any of that. So there is no foraging. There is no hunting. I would increase the levels of difficulty on that scale significantly because even if you can find water, it's probably not safe to drink. It's probably brackish and ashy from the, from the ash. Uh, there's no beast's flesh that's good to taste because it's all riddled with disease. And to Josh's point, at the edge of decay and death every day. There's no vegetation, not again, covered in this ash. And again, how is it, it doesn't rain here. It only falls ash like snowfall. There is no wood from the trees that's not pulpy and rotten. So it is, of course, difficult to burn and will smoke, therefore giving away your position. So your survival strategy for the poison forest is to bring everything you can with you on a big honking cart because you're going to need a lot of it to get through this rather large place. And you're also not really going to want to spend spend a lot of time in there because the corruption of the poison forest will actually get into the stuff that you yeah. bring and start to break it down and and cause that problem. Like this is a cursed area. Yeah. Avoid it at all costs. <laughs> Just as a reference, the difficulty number for wilderness survival tests in the poison forest is a 12. Mm. Yeah, that's nothing to sneeze at. Which is equal to the Badlands and the Wastes, both equally yeah. corrupt areas. The Bloodwood is only a 10, uh, just as a point of comparison. <laughs> Whereas regular woodlands are only a difficulty five. Yeah, so that's significantly different. That gives you an idea of... Uh, how tough that's going to be. How much harder thing is. I don't know if you've recorded it yet, but I know there's at least one entry in the Book of Exploration that has a tie-in to the Poison Forest. Do you remember the name of it? Where there's a map or something. I don't know whether you've recorded it yet or not. I don't remember which one it is That's off the fair. top of my head. Uh, uh, is it the Elemental Fountain? Mm, the Fountain Parchment. Is that what it's called? Maybe. The Fountain Parchment, I think, is the parchment about the Elemental Fountain. Yes, I, that one I recorded. Okay. Flip to, you've got the book right there. Flip to it and just double check if that's yeah. the one that I'm thinking of. Because I think the parchment is like a map or map fragment directing you to a place within the poison forest that apparently has. Yeah, this is uh, true elements. Years. Yeah, this is about the elemental earth uh, fountain. Okay. Does it mention it's a poison forest from Jerus through the poison forest to right. where okay. it supposedly is on the other side of the poison forest in the in nope. the outskirts of the waste? Your brain is better than my research. So yeah. So the fountain parchment that's in one of the uh, legends episodes. Yep, that's in. Um, that's in the Book of Exploration, uh, Legends of Barsave, Volume 2. Yes. That's yeah, the second story. So yeah, you absolutely would. Second entry, you absolutely would have recorded that at this, by this point. Yeah. So it's probably uh, so, four or five episodes. Yeah, four, go back five, and look at, the, look at the specials. The, the show notes have oh. the names of all the ones that are, that are in it. And, absolutely. We're not going to research that one for you right now. Uh, any final thoughts on forests in general or these two specifically? No, uh, we actually got more out of this than I thought we were going to. We had a lot of ecology, so. <laughs> and we had a lot of kind of like sidetracks. And I imagine that when we kind of cut out the the bits of research and flipping through books and stuff that we had <laughs> in this one, it might not end up being quite as so long. We'll shave five or six minutes out, yeah. Forests are an iconic fantasy environment. No, oh, totally. Tolkien. Tolkien. I mean, you've got Rivendell... Yeah. Lothlorien, Mirkwood, there's the old forest at the edge of the Shire that features yep. prominently at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring, where Tom Bombadil lives. Like, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff that you can use as inspiration that we've talked about. Totally. So, uh, folks, if you have any questions for us, again, that email address is edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, avoid the poison forest at all costs for your legend. Good night, everybody. 